can see my presentation right now. Um, yep. Thanks for the invitation again to talk today about the work that we're doing in our lab. And um, so what we try to do in our lab is mainly centered around aptamer technology. So we, we're trying to identify aptamers for different targets, for different indications, um, to use them as therapeutic and diagnostic settings. But also we, we, we do some work in our lab to improve the, the process or to, to develop new techniques by which we can generate aptamers and more easily or with different properties. So most of you have done an um, aptamer selection in the past. We, we face a lot of challenges in this regard. So one of the most prominent challenges is PCR bias that we all see or byproduct formation with molecular parasites and so on. So we can circumvent this a little bit by by digital droplet PCR or by Bay emulsion PCR, by very, very careful design of the primer, uh, primer, primer regions of, of libraries. Um, we also face, um, like Beatrice showed us, uh, problems with targeting small molecules in the lab, which is mainly circumvented by, by the capture CDX approach, which is really, really nice. And Beatrix told you already how we can use this. And I think this is really a, a, a game changer in the field. We're also doing this a little bit. We do this in an automated way. And so we try to automate the process as much as possible. But there is this, a notion um, that CELEX procedures have had and still have a very low success rate. Um, so if you use canonical sets of base pairs, and in, in our lab, in our hands, and also I think in, in the paper from Larry Gold and Summer Logic that I cite here, this, this success rate has been around about 25 to 30% in, in terms of protein targets and the selection of DNA aptamers. So what helps in this regard is some kind of NGS helps. If you can see poor replicating sequences in the enriched libraries and identify those with, with deep sequencing. But what helps a lot is uh, having uh, the implementation of new chemical entities. So thereby expanding the, the chemical diversity of libraries. So this is the seminal paper, I think, that um, some logic has published um, almost 11 years ago, and where they used these chemical modification, introduced this into DNA libraries and select a, a series of aptamers. And most of the, the summer scan aptamers that they're using right now are based on this technology. So there's, there are other technologies. I, I don't mention here the Phil Holliger's work with the base, with the um, backbone modifications and Pete Herbert's work, but what I also like very much is the, the extended base pairs, where you add another base pair to the two canonical base pairs that work by from Stephen Banner's lab with this the SAT and DP base pairs, but also the work um, with um, HR, of HR Hirao's group of the hydrophobic base pair. These have the potential to identify aptamers that have either different properties or aptamers for targets that escape the selection procedure with canonical sets of base pairs. So what we started to do in our lab in 11 years ago <laughs> is we used the, the a click chemistry approach to modify libraries that have embedded this EDU moiety. Yeah? And so we, we generate the libraries that have the EDU and then we use click chemistry with A sites to modify the library, for instance, with this indole modification there. And so in our lab, it took us around about four years to, to get this relatively simple scheme that, we, that I show here schematically up and running. So what we start with is, a, is a, this ethanol modified library, then we do a click chemistry step to introduce these modifications. We then do a conventional selection, which is incubation with the target, separation, recovery of the bound species, amplification by PCR. And this, and we do a normal PCR, just replacing the um, deoxy and tamine triphosphate with the EDU triphosphate. Yeah, but we have kind of an imprint of the modification with the ethanol DU. And then we can do lambda nuclease digestion, get the single strand, then the cycle starts again and again. So um, we, we had a, a first, um, so the first successful selection that we did, and it took us, I don't know, 10 or 20 of those selections to optimize it, that we, we finally yield an aptamer that has been modified with indole and which binds to, to GFP as shown here. And this was our very first example published in 2015. And then we had a, another example for a small molecule, which is Delta 9 tetrahydrocannabinol, 
if you can see here, it's a schematic of the Zaptimer. So we didn't solve the structures yet of any of these Zaptimers that we really would like to, but we just didn't start this yet. So this is a, a short version of the Zaptimer that binds to tetrahydrocannabinol. It's modified with benzyl. And it just has, so we, we, we optimized it and chopped it down. We, we analyzed all the positions that are necessary for having a benzyl residue. And it ended up with, with one benzyl residue shown here with this tiny black dot here and all the others are canonical base pairs, but it highly depends. So the binding activity of this aptima to THC highly depends on the presence of the benzyl moiety and the absence of it doesn't bind at all. So the beauty, what I think about our process is that in, in theory, we can generate a lot of different A sites and you do not have to be a super chemist to do all these, these modifications. So especially those very simple molecules shown on top of the slide are easily accessible by a, a one-step chemical synthesis. They're quite stable. You can store them for a long time. And these are, this is a, a representation of all the, the, the A sites that we have either synthesized in our lab and some of them, so that the glycans and the sugar moieties and this cyclic peptide we, we just bought. And also this molecule we can easily buy. And all the greens one we have used in selection procedures, but um, so looking at the slide again, so all those that has this arrow with the green, they should be green as well because we use them in, in the meantime in the selection procedure too. So I, what I have to um, say is that, so I want to say that I and yesterday presented a Selma process in which they introduced successfully these glycan structures. In our process, we never were able yet to select aptimers that depend on, on these carbohydrates. When you clicked it in, we, it always failed for some, other, and we don't know why, but um, this was published in 2011. And I have to admit that we, we came across it only during the, the review process of the first paper that we submitted. And we never found it before. Anyway, so in the meantime, um, there is another interesting and I think a very beautiful paper that has been published by Julian Tanners and Mark Holmstein's group. They, in, they do a very similar process, a process that is, I think, identical to what Magda from Prebiologics has presented um, to presentations prior to mine. Um, they, they do not click on the, on the level of the DNA they click on the level of the nucleotide triphosphate. And, and what um, Julian has done together with Marcus, they, they used this Cuban molecule and introduced it into a library selected for lactide dehydrogenase and they solved this beautiful structure with this hydrophobic patch here. And so I, th I think this, this shows a little bit the versatility, but it also shows us that we are kind of limited. So what we can do with all these modifications is we can do one selection after the other and test which of those modifications or any other we could synthesize work very well in, in our process. But this is kind of very laborious. And, and as we haven't automated the process yet, this will take a lot of time. So a student in my, in my group, Olga, she thought about this as well. And she said, okay, why, why don't we make use of, of kind of a split combined approach? And like it is used in, in combinatorial chemistry to synthesize large sets of, of compound libraries. So what she did is, she used the, the starting library, she split it up in, into five portions. Then the, she um, modified each of these um, sub-libraries with one specific uh, A site, mixed it up again, and did the selection. So incubated with the target molecule, um, separated, recovered the bound species, did the PCR, did the single strand displacement. And then he split up this library again into these five portions did the modification with the individual, individual A sites, combined them again, and did the selection again. So she, she did two proof of concepts, one targeting a GFP again, which we knew it is, is, an, is a good target for the click sex approach. And she used these one, two, three, four, five different modifications. So indole, which has been working beforehand, and but also benzofurane, benzyl, chlorobenzyl, and the ethylene amine. And after eight cycles of the split combined procedure, she did, she did an analysis of the cycle eight DNA, which is shown here, um, using flow cytometry, in which she 
click the library with different A sites and individual tests at the library having either indole, benzofurane, benzal, chlorobenzal, or the ethanol amine. What you can see here is that section. So we obviously in which species that bind in the presence of, of indole. We obviously in which species that bind in the presence of benzofurane, but not with benzyl. And all, as it seems, not with chlorobenzyl and not with the amine residue here. So this is kind of the enriched library. So what she did then is to, to delineate a little bit. So what which members of the library that we have enriched bind in the presence of which type of, of modifications, she thought to do a deconvolution step. And this is relatively straightforward. So she again used the DNA from selection cycle eight, split it up into, in this case, three portions, and then did the, but net didn't mix it again. So that she omitted the combined step and did three individual selection steps with only one modification and analyzed this then again with NGS. So the idea is if you do it only with this modification, you will enrich for these species. If you do it with this modification, you enrich with these species. And compared to the selection cycle eight, you will see which is the favorite modification of which click model we, we did enrich in the library. So these are the NGS data. For the sake of clarity and for an ease to follow, we were focusing on these um, four click MERS in the library. So this is the selection cycle eight shown here. So these are the selection cycles. That's the frequency of individual sequences in these libraries. So this is the, the sequence I10. This is the sequence F20. Down here, that's P33, and that's the C1 sequence. So if you do now the one cycle of, of deconvolution using the indole moiety, what you can see very nicely is the frequency of the indole depending sequence, which is I10, is going up significantly. And the other ones, especially the, the furin, benzofurin depending sequence F20 is going down. Yeah? So this indicates that this probably is an indole depending binder, this is an benzofurin depending binder. What we then did is, um, she um, did the same with benzofurane. So, and you can see it very, so to me, this is, I didn't expect that to see this so dramatic. So this binder, which is depending on indole, is almost vanishing upon the selection cycle with just having benzofurane present, whereas the benzofurane depending binder is going up and the other one is, is missing as well. If you do the same approach with, with benzyl, and you can see that the indole depending binder is going down, the benzofurane depending binder is going down, but C1 depending binder, one seems to be a benzyl depending binder, is going up as well. And if you look down there more closely, you can see that we have a sequence which is called B33, which is has a very low frequency. So this is 0.5 times to um, um, 10 to the power of minus 3% in the library, the sequence is almost vanishing. So we couldn't detect it in selection cycle eight, but in nine, it goes strongly up again. Uh, and these sequences all bind quite, quite well with different affinities to, um, to, the, um, to GFP. As you can see here, so benzofurane modified F20 seems to be the, the one with the highest affinity. This is the one with the lowest affinity. But what you also have seen is that we think, so we did some kinetic measurements with SPR and you can see that, that the B33, which has almost no, so according to the sequencing depth that we have applied, we couldn't find it in selection cycle eight. So it, it was almost, almost lost. Yeah? And this has the, the, the quickest off rate. So it has the unfavorable kinetics. And so we, we lost it, but, um, if we change the selection pressure, having just favoring the benzyl modified sequences, it gain copy numbers again. So this shows us that we can use this methodology to select for sequences that depend on different binding behavior, but it also gives us an in, insight in how the selection process indeed works. So we have never seen this before. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by it and, and we, we try to extend this now. So she, she moved on to a second model target, so streptavidine, boring model target, you can use it very easily, but that it was not the case to select the most fantastic 
sequences for a the, the most challenging targets at that point, but you use threat to value, value because it has been shown that it's a good target for DNA selects. Um, so you can easily select aptamers for threat to value using DNA. So she used these five different modifications now, so changed it, the set a little bit and did again eight selection cycles. And what you can see here is um, that it again, it seems that the selection with benzyl worked very well, probably also with, with the phenol modification, and maybe also with this one here, with the isobutyl, but not with the guanidinium. And with indole, maybe a little bit, but what you can also see from here, and it was also uh, shown on the slide, on the Richmond slide with, the, with GFP, what we see is that uh, in the case of modifications, we see different types of background binding. So the affinity of the starting library very dependent, very dramatically in terms of what kind of modification we have clicked in. So we see a strong background binding to structure in with indole, not a strong one with benzyl, a stronger one with phenol, and not a strong one with this. So, and this is kind of reflected a little bit also in the rich library. Yeah. So what she then did is two cycles of deconvolution. Yeah. So, and um, I'm showing you this here because we, we are focusing on these sequences on G1, B1, and P2. So these are individual sequences. And you can see the binding of those sequences in the presence of the different uh, A sites that we clicked in. And this portfolio looks very different. So the B1 sequence binds very well in the presence of benzyl, but not so well with any other modifications, a little bit with the isobutyl. But the P2 seems to be bind independent of what kind of modification we have clicked in, but not on the ethanol state. So it needs to be clicked in. Whereas the gonadinium, so G1 sequence, doesn't need a modification at all. It binds with gonadinium, but it also binds an ethanol and it also binds just as a DNA. And if you look at to, into this deconvolution step, so this dash here marks the, the selection cycle eight. So until this, um, step we did the, uh, the, the split combined procedure and afterwards for cycle eight and nine we did uh, um, the deconvolution having just one modification present there so and if we do this with benzyl you can see that the b1 sequence which has very low copy numbers in round eight kicks in and you see high copy numbers of the two cycles the p the p2 sequence is vanishing very strongly in this regard so it starts from 20 but it goes down to yeah, let's say 15% and no 5% or so. G1, we can't see here. We, we come back to this. Um, so this sequence here, the, the, the reddish one, that's an indole dependent sequence. We don't focus on this yet. So, but if we change to guanidinium, so again here, there should be the dashed line. So this is the split combined procedure. If you change with, for guanidinium, you see that the G1 sequence gain a dramatically increase in copy numbers whereas P2 is vanishing and all the other sequences are going down as well. Huh? Why, uh, so it, again, this is not a gonadinium depending binder. It's a, it binds also in the absence of any modification and as a DNA, but why it comes up with gonadinium, I, we have no explanation for that. It's just an observation. If you use phenol, yeah, what we see here is that all the sequences are going down. So those two sequences we're looking at are going down. And this sequence here, the P2, stays at the, at the same level, which indicates that it, it binds with phenol, of course, but it also binds with all the others. But as there is no other sequence obviously present that gains copy numbers in the presence of phenol, this just stays here and doesn't vanish like the other sequences. So we find these, these binders here. And um, so here again, this is, we have, determine some KD values. So the B1, the benzyl modified steroid binder has a very low, uh, high affinity. The G1, which is in this case, just measured as a DNA. Yeah? So has a higher affinity. It has a, a, full, a, a sequence, which is very similar to the standard um, steroid binding sequences that many labs have, have selected in the past. So we can also test a bit of the chemical landscape. So we using we have used the B1, which is the benzyl depending binder with all these other modifications here. You can see that this set here of these three residues, when you click in those, we, we still see a good binding, a little bit also with this isobutyl here, but not with the phenol um, modification, for instance. So this shows that this really kind of, there is an impact on, on what we, can click in and how the affinity and the, the binding is mediated. 
So to, to conclude, and the last three slides will just show you a couple of examples that we've done with so-called real targets that we use in the lab for developing aftermaths for specific purposes. So, and just one slide for each target. So, and these are all unpublished data. So we did a, a split combined selection also for CXTL9. And this mainly yielded um, sequences that bind in the presence of indole. We didn't get any for benzyl. We didn't get any for phenyl and for gonadinium. We again did get a sequence, which is this one here, G1, T3, which binds in the presence of indole modification, but also it binds in the absence of any modifications. There's a slight difference in affinity. Yeah? It binds as a DNA, but it also binds with the indole, which with a higher affinity. And, but that's, again, we can't explain this. It's just an observation. We found this aptima here. We, we also did a series of selections um, um, for the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. And in this case, we, we enriched libraries that only bind in the presence of benzofurane of this modifications. We didn't get any with this, with this, with this, with this. And um, we, some of those sequences have, and has, have been investigated further. So there's one, two, three, four sequences. So we, that's the original entity that we used for the selection. So all these sequences bind in the presence of this modification without modification that do not bind. You can substitute the benzofurane with the benzotyrophene. Still, you see proper binding, and, but you cannot replace it with indole. It, so this binding goes completely to background levels with these three sequences. There's still some binding with this. So this shows us that we have, again, flexibility in terms of how we can investigate the, uh, the, the function of these aptamers. So the last example I would like to show you is that we also use this. So we've done a couple of selections for cells in the past and in vivo selections as well. So we use this split compliant procedure to target prostate cancer cell lines, so PC3, and we're using these five different entities in this regard. So a very large entity and others that we haven't used before. And we enriched aptamers to bind with these four different entities, but not with indole. So this was the first example that we generated in our lab, where we didn't get an enrichment with indole, which to our surprise, which is because this is one of the most successful entities that we can use. And also some of you use this a lot, a lot and then she has shown that this is, has uh, superior properties, but for the cell lines, we didn't get this. And this is the example of one of the aptamers we identified. Um, which is modified with imidazole, so it binds to PC3 cell lines quite well, has not a very strong affinity to all the other cell lines. This is in the gray, we see a scramble sequence, which has the same sequence composition, but in a different order. Okay, so with this examples, I'm at the end. So um, so we, we we spend a lot of time in the past 10 years to, to, to establish this click Celix process for base modified aptamers. We think that we split combine we can simultaneously um, search for many more different modifications that might be better for a target or not. And the spike um, example is very intriguing. So we have to spend the full range modification, but didn't succeed with the others. Um, we can apply to different targets. We did it for proteins and cells so far, but there's no reason to, that we cannot use it for small molecules as well. I think it would be doable and we can, do something so we still don't understand a lot about how the cell process works and what happens on a population level. So but I think with this approach, we really can do this. Just more systematically to understand what is the impact of pressure that we we change or we, we apply on specific species within these libraries. And this brings me to my last slide, which is the thank you slide, of course. So the, all the click CLX procedures that we have done started with Fabian Toller in the lab. And Francisca and Malte um, so joined in with the, with the THC example. The split combine was um, developed mainly by, by um, Olga Plüktun. And the examples that I've shown were then provided by, by Anna Jonczyk in the lab, by Ian, and Julia Siegel, and by Mujab Shukaifi. And I thank you for your attention. <laughs>